Revelation chapter 16 today. Uh, Revelation chapter 16 is... Uh, fifth, chapter 15 really kind of prepared us for chapter 16. So chapter 15 was kind of the introduction. All the characters were ready to go. And then chapter 16 begins. So um, chapter 16 is, is... This is the judgments that we've been waiting for since Revelation chapter 11. Okay? So we've actually been... The, the, the trumpet, the seventh, the seventh, sixth trumpet, seventh trumpet was sounded way back then, but we haven't got to it till here. We kind of had all these interludes, chapter 12, chapter 13, chapter 14, chapter 15, and now here we are finally. This, this is, do you remember when we talked about the first terror, the second terror, and the third terror? Do you remember that? That was way back in Revelation chapter 11. So it's been like seven years ago, I think, when we were on that. <laughs> And so we, we, if you remember that, this, this is the third terror of the three terrors. So we, we're just getting to that now. And um, all the interlude was kind of fleshing out some things um, that we had done before, specifically clearing up some of the roles of, the, of Satan, the Antichrist, uh, the, the false prophet, all those things that were kind of fleshed back into the story. So you kind of had the story given to us. We had the 200 million man army kind of approaching in the sixth trumpet, if you remember that. And then all of a sudden we kind of went backwards and then we kind of looked at Israel's history and then all the way through the church and then all that kind of stuff happening. And then we, so we had all this break, but what it was doing was fleshing out the story that had already been told. So you kind of had the, the, a, a brief narrative and now you have kind of a fleshing out of what's happening in that narrative. This is what's going to happen in this. So you're going to have all these things happen here, and then the next chapters are going to try to try to continue to flesh out the story as it appears here. So you're getting kind of the whole story, and then we're going to go back and kind of flesh it in so you understand. Because as you read chapter 17, 18, and 19, and 20, you'll be or really 17, 18, and 19, where it talks about Babylon and all these different things, it'll be... Uh, It'll just be more information on what we're talking about today and some even the things we've already talked about. So just uh, just get ready to uh, be prepared for that. LaRue, yes? Yes, the bold judgments, the question was, does it happen in the last three and a half years? The bold judgments are at the very end of the Great Tribulation. It could be... Um, I'm not exactly sure the timetable could be the last six months, could be the last year, but it, it could be the last two months. It's, very, it's a very brief time. Matter of fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25, if it wasn't the fact that, that the Lord shortened the days, nobody would survive. Do you remember when Jesus said that? Right. He's talking about this moment right here. If, if, the, if God hadn't made these judgments fast and furious, not to be confused with the movie, you sinners. Uh, if, it, what he's trying to say is he's trying to say, look, if this didn't happen fast, nobody would, there would be nobody left after these things if he extended it out. So this is really a, a brief time. We don't actually know the exact timetable. All we know is this is happening at the very end. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of things you can look at as far as how many weeks, Daniel 70 weeks, and how long that week is, and how many weeks are in the Jewish calendar, the 42 weeks that are that. I think it's 42 or 47 weeks that they talk about. Well, we have 52 weeks, so there's kind of a kind of a like a four week kind of overlap, and that could be this could be those four weeks all catching up at the very end. I don't know. I just know it's very it's at the very very end. So, so um, does someone want to read the first two verses? We're gonna hit this a few verses at a time. Go ahead, Ron. Okay, so what I, one of the things I, I forgot to mention that I want to mention when you talk about the, these particular judgments are very similar um, to the judgments that were expressed during the ten plagues of Egypt. So I don't know if you, I don't think you can read this without thinking back to the ten plagues of Egypt because there's so many things that happen um, that are very similar, but they're out of order. So like God didn't do the same thing twice. 
Besides that, there are ten plagues and there are seven bowls. So math says you're probably not going to have all those represented, correct? So what I want you to think about today is um, there are some there are some uh, some of the uh, of the plagues that aren't represented. I want you just to be thinking why why would God pick these particular ones to duplicate? Because I do think, by the way, I do think there's a reason for that. I don't think what you'll notice are missing are like are like the flies and the locusts and the a lot of the insects and that kind of stuff is missing. But a lot of the more what I would say the death of the firstborn that's missing out of here. But the death of the firstborn was actually something to, that represented Christ, that was communicating Christ to people very powerfully. So that is missing in this institute because you don't have to communicate Christ because everybody knows about him. And people, people know, by the way, at this point, they know who Jesus is and you're either on his side or against him. And by the way, in, if you remember the 10 plagues of Egypt, in the 10 plagues of Egypt, uh, the first three plagues were affected Everybody felt the effect, both the Hebrews and the Egyptians. From the fourth plague on, only the Egyptians felt the brunt of those plagues. So like when darkness fell on the land of Egypt, the darkness was so thick they could feel it. Okay, That's, that's not just, oh, there's an eclipse. Okay, we, You remember having the eclipse here in Payette? I mean, it, it was dark, but come on. All the lights came on, like in our parking lot, but it wasn't like you couldn't see anything. So, so if you think about the darkness that hit Egypt, it wasn't an eclipse. It was something supernatural. And it was so dark they could feel it. But in the land of Goshen, it was, the lights were on. It's kind of like when we have an inversion and you go to Boise. It's like all of a sudden, the sun, it's here. You know, people who are not living in Boise or our area are like, what are you talking about? It's a local thing. Okay, so verse, verse 1 talks about this voice coming from the temple. If you remember back in chapter 15, the last verse in chapter 15, you had the glory of God filling the temple so nobody could enter. Okay? Um, you do realize that when, when John wrote this, he didn't break it up into chapters. We, we broke it up into chapters later, and the reason that people did that is because they wanted to be able to find verses and information in Scripture very easily. So sometimes when they, when they made the decision on where to break things up, they kind of chose interesting spots. So if you're just looking at chapter 16, you won't remember in chapter 15, which seems forever ago, that the Spirit of the Lord was in a, so thick, nobody could enter in the temple. So whose voice is this coming out of the temple? It has to be the Lord's, right? <clears throat> Go your ways and pour out on the earth the, the seven bowls. And these bowls aren't like what you have cereal in. These are... These are like flat saucer-like bowls, which they used uh, for drink offerings. So a person who is familiar with, uh, with Old Testament worship, they did drink offerings. Uh, when Jesus said, uh, um, uh, Jesus said, uh, come to me, you are th- all you who are uh, thirsty. You know, when they, when, you know, people were going to give a drink offering and Jesus said that. He was, they were giving a drink offering. They were pouring out. Um, they put wine in a bowl and they pour it out. And when they were doing that, Jesus was saying, I'm the one who will satisfy the thirst that you have. And so that, that's, that's the picture. So they have this really thin bowl and they pour it and right up here. And, and uh, they pour that out and that's the drink offering. So that's the seven bowls. The first angel. So the first angel left the temple, poured out its bowl. And what's the target of the bowl? Where is the bowl judgment happening on? On the earth? Now, what I want you to note is that each judgment has a specific target. They're not all the same. As you read it, you'll be like, it's very important for you to kind of catch that detail because where the target is is, is what it affects. So this, so this target is the earth. So therefore, who's affected by these sores and boils? Everybody. Okay. Now, the only exception would be Christians. Believers are not affected. They're the only ones. Everybody else is. So, LaRue. Now, uh, is that all over the world? All over the world. The earth would be the earth. All over the world. Yeah, everybody. Every man, 
woman and child. Everyone. Okay, so then, no matter if you're buried in a mountain, like a lot of mountains are tunneled down for people, uh -huh. no matter where you're at, even in a space station, you're going to get it. Yes. Okay, nobody hides. No, there's no... There's, there's no, there, no, it, everyone, everyone, there's no hiding from this. Everyone is affected by this. Could this be a biological weapon? Sure. Does it have to be one? Absolutely not. Did Moses have a biological weapon? He whipped out. Yeah, he didn't really have that. He didn't need that. He had God. Yeah. Matter of fact, one of the, one of the tricks God told Moses is just stick your hand in your cloak coming out and there it looks like leprosy and put it back in. But he did that and that was... Yeah, so you don't, you don't need to have a scientific evidence. At this point, these things that are happening are, are so cataclysmic, you don't need to have a naturalistic interpretation of why this could happen. I don't think there is a naturalistic interpretation for these. Um, I, think it's just, I think it's divine wrath. So, um, and again, if you want to know how, why, I, why I say people in the you know, Christians aren't affected... If you look at the end of verse 2, horrible malignant source broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped his statue. So those are the people that are affected. Do you, here's a question for you. Do you think there are people during the tribulation that are not Christians but have not worshipped at the altar of the beast or taken his mark? Do you think there's possible there are people like that? Yes. Yeah. You know how I know that? Because I live in Idaho. <laughs> right? Because there are people who will not, who may not worship at the altar, but they ain't getting that mark, you know. Okay. There are people, I believe there are people who aren't, aren't necessarily going to be Christians that are going to make it through the tribulation. But not the people that take the mark. They won't make it through the tribulation. Okay. Everyone who takes the mark of the beast is gone at the end of the tribulation. But you think there are people who don't necessarily take the mark that might make it through the tribulation. Yes, correct. Everybody knows. You have to, I, I think you have to choose a side at this point. It's pretty obvious you have to choose a side. I mean, it's pretty bad. Um, okay, so uh, in Exodus chapter 9 is the, uh, the plague of the boils. Um, why do you think God would choose? Because the first plague that God chose for... Uh, the nation of Israel, was blood, right? Is that right? Blood, was the, blood in the water was the first one. Uh, I think this is the fourth one. The sores that broke on the people is the fourth one, if I remember correctly. I've done a lot today. But why would God pick this particular one as the one to kick off the judgments? Why, why such a personal and painful, Right? Because boils and sores, you're talking a lot of personal pain. This isn't just affecting an army. This isn't just affecting the military. This is affecting everybody. Why this judgment? Now, by the way, I don't expect us to have God's answer. I just, I just want to kind of, I just kind of want you to think about of all the of all the things that God could pick just to begin the bold judgments. Why would He pick something so personal? Because it is personal. It's one thing. Yeah, it, I, and I really do. I think it's like. What Ron said is to get your attention. Okay. It's the sixth plague. I just looked it up. Sixth plague. Thank you. Thank you. I should have had it written down. So. No, that's okay. I got your back. Yeah. So. I got your six. Fact checker. Oh yeah, fact checker. We need fact checkers. On Facebook. So just just so you know, just so you know why, I, I really do think it's because that people react to personal pain quicker than anything else, and if and if you're going to repent. The first plague is a lot better time to repent than the seventh plague. Well, how can they repent if they've taken the mark of the beast? Well, they can't. But if, you're, if you haven't and you see the, everybody else getting it, I think it'd be a good indication that now's the time to, to choose your side. Right? Because I, I do think this is... And I think it, it takes personal pain sometimes to move people to a point where they'll repent. So I think it's a wake-up call for people who haven't made a decision. You would think so. But you know what? Humanity, humanity is stubborn. I'm just telling you, humanity is stubborn. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not enough. 
Because you know what's funny is some of these judgments we're looking at today have already happened during the trumpet judgments, but the trumpet judgments were on a third of the earth. So like we already saw the third of the earth uh, affected with blood and a third of the sea life die. And this one we're going to see all the oceans affected with blood and all the sea life die. And it's like, so if you couldn't get it at a third, now there's nothing left. So at, the, at what point do you say, well, we can wait. We still have this. You know, sometimes if people have just enough, a little bit, they'll hold on to their sin because there's a little bit of hope that they can continue going. And so God takes all that away. Tanda? The Lord told, the Lord, by the way, the Lord, and I'm just, this is my Bible reading right now. The Lord actually brought Israel to a place where they had no hope but him. There was a road they could go on that was, would have circumvented the Red Sea, but God didn't take them that way because had, had, God, given, had God given the option, God said they will turn back before they, when they see Egypt coming, they'll just turn back. So God put them in a place where they couldn't turn back. Sometimes, by the way, sometimes the greatest miracles in your life happen in spots where you have no other place to go. So why is God doing this right here? Because it's the only place they have to go. You don't have any, there's no, there's no other options. The seven bold judgments, and you're going to see this as you read this, the reason for these bold judgments is that they would turn and serve the Lord. That there would be people that would turn and serve the Lord. God's still giving people an opportunity to come to him. So when I ask the question, are there still people who have made a decision? Well, if there aren't, if they're just Christians and then people taking the mark, then why would God give them an opportunity to re- return and turn to their faith? So there's got to be somebody there who can, who can make that choice. Ron? I, have a, I just have a curious, when it talks about the temple, this... Heaven's temple, yes. Heaven's yeah, this, I would not say, I would not believe this is the earthly temple. We talked about that last week. There is debate. I'll be honest. There's debate, but I, I just think it's the heavenly temple because, I, you know, the glory of God manifest in that way seems to be something. Else. And the angels all kind of flying around up there kind of make more sense. Nobody could, could go into the temple right. when this was going on. Right. So it's something that's very, it's, it's wrapped. Yeah, it's, it's powerful. Wrapped. And plus, I, plus it also, the fact that nobody can go into the temple means there's a finality to it. Like you're, you can't go in and intercede. It's like the, the ship has left, no, the train has left the station. The ship has left the dock. I don't know. Kay, did you have a question? Um, well, just kind of an observation since I kind of looked that up for you. But um, we're, you were saying that uh, that first judgment, it affects people with boils. And it was the sixth judgment in Egypt that affected them with boils. Okay. It was the same parallel. But the, and six being the number of men. Oh, yeah. Because so, all the other ones are on livestock, animal, water. So could that potentially be a correlation too? Is that it's man being affected? Could be, could be. So the six, the six plague being coordinated to the number of man that maybe it's because of mankind that are being affected. Could be. I just know. I just know it's personal. You know, mm-hmm. pain is personal. If someone else is, if someone else is dealing with it, it's not your thing. But if you're dealing with it, yeah, then it's then it's all then it's really important. You never care about pain like you do your own. If someone else says, boy, my back really hurts, you go, oh, that's too bad. And you go on with your life. Your back is hurting. That's all that matters. You know what I mean? Uh, continue on verse 3 through 7. We're going to really hit a few here. Does someone want to read that? Thank you, Carrie. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse. And hmm. Okay, so we have, um, we have the second and the third judgment, both kind of sharing the same result. One is directed toward the sea, right? And one is directed toward the springs and the rivers. So the springs would be both water above and below ground, right? 
Springs are above and below ground. So you're talking this same thing, by the way, when Moses cursed the water, it wasn't just the Nile that was water, that was red. It was blood. It was all of it. It's the same kind of thing. Even the ones that were in the jars. Even ones in the jars that they collected, yes. Now, what's interesting about the second seal, uh, sorry, the second, uh, the second bowl, is the fact that uh, the, bl- the blood is described. How is the blood described in that second judgment? The blood of a corpse. So what's the difference between the blood of a person that's living and the blood of a corpse? It's dead blood. There's no life in it. David? Yeah, it, yeah, it's black and it's coagulated. So it's, not, it's, it's, it's almost like a gel. You know, in England they make what's called blood pudding. And it's, they used congealed blood to do it. I've actually had blood pudding because I went to Australia and they tricked me. No, she said, you need to try this sausage. I said, okay. How does it taste? I said, oh, it tastes okay. It tastes like uh, ring bologna is what it tastes like. And then she goes, oh, it's blood sausage. I thought, oh, thank you. I won't have any more. <laughs> Are you sure? It's delicious. I'm like, no, nah, I'm okay. <laughs> uh, but you think, of, uh, think about a blood of a corpse. Think of the seas, the whole sea becoming s- coagulated, thick, and black. And of course, yeah, and everything dies in it. Everything. Not a third everything. Do you know how much food we get from the sea? Red lobster struggling. You don't have. You know what I'm saying? I mean, everything is gone. Everything is gone. So you're talking one of the major world's food sources is gone. It's not just the fact that you don't have anything to drink, which is coming for the fresh water, but it's just the fact there's nothing, there's, your food source is gone. And then the same thing happens with the springs in the water. Uh, it's it's brutal. Um, now, if you'll notice, verses 5 through 7, you have this kind of interlude. It's the only time that we have an, uh, an insight into why this particular judgment is happening. God gives a reason why this judgment happens. He doesn't explain himself any other time. He doesn't say, this is why I pick this. But he does for this. What was the reason why the waters were turned into blood? What does the angel say is the reason it happened? Because the, the world was drunk on the wine of Christians, believers, that died during the tribulation. They couldn't get enough. They couldn't satiate themselves. They couldn't kill them fast enough. And because of that, because they spilled blood, their consequence is now they, they only can drink blood. So it's, it's kind of like, you, you know, you, what you sow, you're going to reap. So it wasn't like, you know, they, and I'm not saying everyone in the tribulation period that had the mark actively necessarily killed somebody, but they were complicit in the action. So does this mean that there are Christians in the world that would have clean drinking water? Or is all, is it all the water contaminated? It's all. It says all. All is all. And, and the judgment, is it, is it a little over the top, according to the angels? Is it a little too much? God, you kind of... The, 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 the angels say this is true, and this is just, this is a right recompense. This is, in other words, this is the proper judgment for the sinful behavior. This is equitable. Now, for the saints that gave their lives, yes, equitable. For the people that are drinking blood, I don't think it's that equitable. But according to heaven's standard, it is. Basically, what you sowed, when you sowed and you killed all these people, you're reaping the blood that you sowed. That's what the scripture says. And the Bible does say, what you sow, you reap. You sow the wind, you reap the whirlwind, right? Right? And that's kind of what they did. They actually sowed the wind and they reaped the whirlwind. And, and by the way, the saints that gave their lives in Revelation, we, we see them in Revelation chapter 5 and I think Revelation chapter 7 where they're crying out under the altar for God to avenge the blood that was shed. This is an answer to that prayer. 
This is God responding to the prayers of those who died during the tribulation period, who gave their lives during the tribulation period. Those are the David prayers that we're not supposed to pray. You ever read the book of Psalms? Where you have Psalms where David prays, God, just wipe out my enemies. It's those kind of prayers. God actually does respond to those prayers too. So be careful. Be careful praying that. It does work. Uh, so we have a voice coming out from underneath the... There's, there's two voices. There's a voice of an angel. Verse 5 says, I heard an angel with authority. And then in verse 7, it says, I heard a voice from under the altar. So these, this praise came from two sources. It came from an angel saying it was true and right. And also came a voice from under the altar. Well, what's, where's that voice under the altar? Yes, in Revel- if you look at page 70, on the back side of page 78, there is, I have two verses that are written here, both that deal with voices under the altar. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it says, When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of all who had been martyred by the, for the word of God for be, and, and for being faithful to their testimony. So here are all these people under the altar. So could it be their voice that's saying what, what God's judgment is doing is true? Does that make sense? Okay. The other one is in Revelation chapter 14, verse 18, another angel who had the power to destroy the for, with fire came from the altar. So his voice actually also came from underneath the altar. Could it be another angel's voice? It could. Um, and I, I'm not necessarily telling you it's one or the other. I'm just saying that even in Revelation, we have two characters that actually their voices emanate from that altar. So I don't know which it is. I kind of I like the first one where it's the voices of the martyrs because they're the ones that prayed in, in uh, chapter 6. And they're the ones, and that's, I think, and that's one of the reasons why this is happening is because of the blood that was spilt. So... Uh, verses 8 and 9. Does someone want to read those? Someone want to read that fun thing, Ron? The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with his fire. And everyone was burned by the blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all the fire. And they did not repent of the sins and turn to God and give him glory. Okay. I have a question. Sure, shoot. We have a question. Well, just recognize that what they're pouring is the wrath of God. So their their vessels, they they're not impo- they're not they don't have the power to do these things. It's God's power, right. but they're the ones that are bringing it. But yeah. Yeah, to pour it on the sun. They're, yeah, they're, they're not saying they're slouches. Yeah, these angels aren't slouches. Uh, what, what's the object of God's wrath in this? Okay, so it's not the earth, it's the sun. So what happens, it, what happens is emanating from the sun. Does that make sense? So, what, so, so this heat that is happening, its source is coming from the sun. I want you to see that because I think that's important. I put down something about a solar flare. Because I, one of the, one of the you, you look, uniformly, one of the things that scientists fear, a massive solar flare could literally, if it was big enough, it could actually burn off all the Earth's atmosphere and destroy easily, easily the sun side of the Earth. Also, it would bring everybody back to the Stone Age. If that happened, all electronics, all iPhones, iPhones would still work, all Androids, <laughs> you know, all your, what would teenagers do? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Here's a piece of paper, just draw a picture on it and, and push send. <laughs> That's what you can do. Ron? Yeah, yeah. Some people believe that that got reversed during Noah's flood. That it actually that's what caused everything to change during Noah's flood was that thing got flipped around. Yeah. Yeah. 
without it, you would actually you would have a huge disruption. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That could happen. I just, I, and the, the electromagnetic field is what shields us from solar radiation, too. So no, no electromagnetic, electromagnetic field, you don't need a very big solar flare to have this effect. Because all of a sudden, all the, all the UV rays would come through unrestricted. I've watched a lot of movies. <laughs> That's how we know science, because we've seen disaster movies. And it would happen just like just that. Just like that. <laughs> Dave? Uh-huh. Uh, the only electrical devices at the time was the telegra- telegraph lines, and it burned up the wires. Wow. What was that called, Dave? Carrington. The Carrington, the Carrington effect? 1859. The Carrington effect, did you say? Carrington. Carrington? Yeah. In 1859. I'll have to look it up. I, I didn't know that, so. But, I mean, it, it's not a, you know, an EM pulse could just do that. What I, what I read on a science website... Uh, it would cause a solar flare would, of, that na- of that magnitude would cause failure of the electric power grid, leading to power blackouts possibly lasting for up to 10 years. All electrical equipment would be either badly damaged or rendered useless. All of it. So the idea of having horses in the Battle of Armageddon, a horse's bridle in the Battle of Armageddon, would actually be literal at that point if you had that kind of an event because you wouldn't have tanks anymore. You wouldn't have helicopters anymore. You would just have horses. It'd be Planet of the Apes type of stuff. I'm, I'm, a, watch, I'm watching way too many movies. Okay? The intense heat caused people to burn. Um, like everybody, everybody was burned. Uh, and by the way, there's no, there's no plague in Egypt that relates to the sun. The only Egyptian plague that's close is the plague of darkness. And it's kind of interesting that, one, that we're looking at one bowl that does sun and the next bowl does darkness. So it's almost like they hate the sun, hate the sun, now it's dark. But in, in Egypt, if, I don't know if you ever looked at this, there's almost every plague in Egypt was associated with an Egyptian god. Okay, So the highest in the Egyptian hierarchy of gods was Ra the sun god. And so, and so the fact when the darkness came, the Hebrew god was saying he was greater than the greatest of the Egyptian gods. It was their Zeus. It's their Jupiter. It's their, the big guy. And uh, I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that God here is, the sun is what really sustains all life on the earth. Without, without the sun, there is no life. And so he's using the thing that sustains us to actually inflict judgment upon us. Could this be global warming? No. On a massive scale. On a massive scale. In an instant, by the way. Yes. You know, if, 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 if this is how fast global warming happens, I'm never giving up my SUV. I don't have an SUV. Huh? No. Climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there's probably a fact check happening right now. Disinformation on global warming, climate change. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's one of those things. I don't think it's global warming. I know that I, did, I actually did read that. I, someone asked me that question. A man asked me that question. Is this global warming? And I said, I said no, not, not that fast, not that quick. It's like, oh, it, now it's an issue. <laughs> and, uh, and it's everybody's burned. So it, it has to be something that either, uh, it has to be something where, where the sun gets through the barrier that we, we take for granted today. And it actually, it's more than just more than just a mild sunburn. This is, this is intense heat. The burn, and they have no heat yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's lasting for days on end. Yes. Both sides of the earth would be burned. Yes, correct. It, it's happening on days on end, so both sides of the earth would be burned. Yes. Which would be more conducive of either. It could be actually either or, where the electromagnetic field fails and you get all the solar radiation, which would have that effect or a solar flare, which you'd have that effect. So could, it could be a weapon. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, again, like I said before, it doesn't ha- these judgments don't seem to need a, a natural ph- phenomenon to happen. Uh, it can be something supernatural. It could be a supernova or a mini-nova. 
Yeah, yeah. They just turned up. They just, you know, you have those, at home you have those little knobs where you have turned up the brightness on it. Just turn that up a little bit. Crank it up a little bit. Some people have speculated maybe the earth actually is, has gotten thrown off its orbit and drifts a little closer. But m- my big thought about that is then why you have darkness the next plague. So I don't think it has anything. It doesn't even have to have anything to do with anything. It could, it could all be just supernatural. Um, so we can, we can speculate and say these could be, could be possibilities, but the reality is what the scripture said is true. It, 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 it could be. It could be that kind of heat, and then that's what Chris was talking about for a weapon. You could have that kind of heat followed by, by darkness because it would kick up all the stuff in the atmosphere. But the, but, but the reality, well, we'll look at the darkness in a second. I think the darkness is, is greater than even what that darkness would be. Uh, the, the closest thing we can, we can be familiar with what a nuclear winter would be like would be when Mount St. Helens blew up. This area would probably be more closer to what that experience was like than... I lived in South Dakota when that happened in the 80s, and we still got ash in South Dakota. But you guys here, if you were here in the 80s when that blew up, you could kind of see what that was like. And, and again, you could still see the sun, right? So let's look, let's look at the next thing. Look at verses uh, 10, um, 10 and 11. Someone want to read those two verses? Kelly Joe, give us a hug when you're done. So I'm just kidding. Okay, so what is the object of this plague, of this judgment? Yeah, well, that's the reason, but what's, what's, who's, getting, who's getting struck with this? Right, the, the throne of the beast, which would be his seat of power, right? That doesn't mean a chair sitting somewhere, you know. That means where most of the time when you're talking about the throne, you're talking about the capital city. You're talking about where the power is, the throne of the beast and his kingdom. Notice that. So, you know, I, looking, at, looking at end time theology, I don't think that he has necessarily consolidated all world power toward him. Because otherwise, who's fighting on the other side of Armageddon? Right? You got a battle of Armageddon, you just have, you know, just have Israel on one side and everybody else on the other side. I don't necessarily think that's true. But you have just his kingdom being affected by this. Right? Is that what it says? It's just his kingdom. So we talk about like nuclear winter and all those kind of things. Talk about solar flares. This is a very specific area of darkness, which if you look back at the plagues of, of Egypt, only affected Egypt. The land of Goshen was all nice and sunny. So you had the same kind of thing. You had God, God um, respecting his people and the people that were under the authority of Egypt were being punished. And that seems to be what's happening here. So it's very specific where this darkness is. And the darkness is uncomfortable. Right? If you look at if you look at it, they ground their teeth in anguish. Okay? That means that with this darkness is comes some some people have said this is almost like a, a this is like a hell preview. In hell, hell is described as being a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. So what this is, this is a hell preview. It's like a coming attractions. And, and yeah, and, and what is the purpose of all this stuff that happens in verse 11? What's the, what's the, why is God doing all these things? What does it say at the end of verse 11? What's the purpose? The, and they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. So the whole purpose in this was that there would be people who would repent and, and, and turn over their hearts to the Lord, but they refused to. See, God is, God is always giving people an opportunity to repent. They chose not to. In the midst of all this, I mean, it's undeniable. It's undeniable what, that this is God. And in, that, in the midst of all that, they'll still deny it. Ron? Uh, 
Oh, if you send somebody back from the grave, or you make this miracle, they'll believe, or they'll do this, right. and right. everything else. And that's not true. Right? You know, it says, you know, you have the prophets, you have the word of God, if you don't listen to that, they won't listen to the miracle. Yes. So that's what that's the story of Lazarus and the rich man, where they said, "Look, if you'll send someone back from the dead, they'll hear." But Jesus said they had Moses and the prophets let them hear them. That's there's enough information there for them to turn their hearts over. The miraculous isn't going to help them. They'll still do what they want to do, and that's what this is saying. They're still doing what they want to do. So I always have to repeat it for the people at home. Now, I, I assume all you're listening. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along, verse twelve. Moving quickly, verse 12 through 16. Anyone want to read that? Go ahead, Ron. The sixth judgment. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates River, and it dried up so that the kings of the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are de- not. They are de- not. Demonic mm-hmm. spirits, spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. Look, I will come and as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are watching for me, who keep their clothes ready, for they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Okay, so six bold judgments, twofold. The first, it dries up the river. The river Euphrates is a huge river. It's always divided the east and the west. Do you know where the Euphrates River is? City of Babylon? Literal city of Babylon is there. Um, that's kind of where the Tigris and Euphrates River combine. He's gonna, and and, and that, that area has always been, historically, where the East and West have been. Napoleon fought a battle there. They've, they've fought battles there throughout history, the East and the West. So what, what's saying here, this is, this is what's always happened. So who do you think the East Army is? Because that's where the army is coming from, right? The, the army from the East is coming to the West, so it would be the army on the east side of that spot. It's coming over. Now, we know in modern warfare, we, 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 put our, we put our troops up in the Middle East, right? We set up our own. It's not like we came from the east to get there. We came from the west and camped right there, and that's where the battle started. So we were ready to go, but we were actually on the west side going east. I understand that. But I'm saying it, it is possible for western countries to put their troops on the eastern side. I don't want you to think that I'm saying it has to be people in the east. It has to be China, India, Nepal. Yeah. Pakistan. Pakistan and India getting together would be a, a, weird, a weird thing. Can't imagine that happening. But who knows. Um, I'm not saying it has to be an eastern nation, but isn't it interesting that the east is coming? Right. Can you imagine if, and this, by the way, is a possibility, that China could be the world power in 20 years. It's not really impossible for us to believe that. We already owe them more money than we have. My TV prices just went up. Right? So it's not impossible to think that a 200 million man army could come from a nation of 1 billion people. I'm not saying it's China because I don't know. I'd be more apt to believe it's more of an Islamic nation than it would be a Chinese atheistic nation. Although, I, I don't know. Doesn't, go ahead, Chris. With the uh, sending out of these things that look like frogs, demonic spirits, he's saying they're going out and convincing the world leaders, so maybe it is China or Russia. And yes. More than And you notice there, the three spirits are likened to frogs, right? Which is because uh, the princess and the frog is a horrible <laughs> the, three, the three frogs, frogs were considered disgusting and unclean for Israelites. And so, the, again, it's not a plague of frogs, but there was a plague of frogs. 
and the frogs come out, and they come, they're three frogs, and they come from three sources. They come from the dragon, so it's Satan. They come from the beast, which is the Antichrist. They come from the, the other beast, which is the false prophet. Those three things. So the three, these three things come out from those three individuals, or three things, and they go out to the world, and they make all these lying wonders and signs. Because at this point, the other side needs to see... Remember how, how, if you remember the plagues of Egypt, remember the first three plagues all could be duplicated by Pharaoh's magicians. And when they could duplicate the plague, Pharaoh felt confident that they could overcome it. So what you're seeing now in the sixth judgment is that Satan is trying to convince the world by duplicating, I think, some of the things that have happened before to let them know that they can defeat the force that's been coming against them. And they're going to say, this force is here to destroy you. This force is here to kill you. We need to rise up and we need to defend ourselves. Look, we, can, we are just as great as the one who's coming against us. And that's, what the, that's why, if you're wondering why this, of all the time, does this duplication happen here? It's because if it doesn't happen here, no one's going to show up for the last battle. This is the only way that the armies of the worlds will gather against the force of God. It's the only thing they can do. It's all they have left. That's why it's happening now, like never before. Does that make sense? Um, uh, let's see here. It is all or nothing. Ver- verse 15. Look at verse 15 for a second before we continue. Um, verse 15 says this, look, I will come unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are those who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so that they will have to walk, they won't have to walk around naked and ashamed. That's where they got that, uh, name of that show from. No, just, just kidding. Do you guys, okay, do you know, do you know, who's that verse 15 for? Is that verse 15, is that for the people that are here now reading the book of Revelation and you get to this point? And all of a sudden, the, instead of looking forward, looking forward, all of a sudden swings back to you to say, hey, you who are reading this, you better be ready. Or is this for the people in the church that are left, that have just endured six of the, these horrific judgments that God is saying, hey, you guys, I'm coming quickly. I'm almost here. Just hold on. Make sure that, you know, the, the, there's a thing in Scripture about our, the, the righteous things that we do are like our righteous, the, the righteous things that God helps us to do is like clothing. Okay, so clothed with righteousness, that means righteousness by faith, but also in our actions and our works. So I know you say, but pastor, the Bible says that our righteousness is filthy rags before the Lord. Well, that's actually before we get saved. When actually we do the right thing, God blesses us. He throws a cloak of righteousness on, just like the, just like the, uh, the, uh, um, the prodigal son, when he came back, the first thing the father did is throw a cloak on him because he received him as his son. So we have this cloak of righteousness to Jesus saying, don't, be, don't give up church in this moment. So I don't know if, are we looking, are we looking in that moment or are we looking back to us to, put a, to make, help us to realize that the Lord is coming quickly? Which is it? Or is it a little bit of both? A little bit of both. I think you can see, I think you can take that as both. I think it's both directed. I, when I read that in the middle of all this, because it just seems like death, destruction, death, destruction, death, destruction. And all of a sudden, to me, the camera comes right on me and says, hey, wake up, I'm coming quickly. Oh, hey. But also, I really can see a church in that moment needing to hear that message. That after you see this judgment, you have to understand this. I could see every church and every Christian and every believer reading this in the Great Tribulation and saying, Jesus is going to come back very, very soon. We're almost through it. It's almost at the end. We just have to endure a little longer. It might, be the, it might be the lifeline that they need at the very end. Um, do I want to start? Do I want to I wanna go to the next one? Let me talk about Armageddon for a second. Ezekiel 38 and 39 references a battle with, with Gog and Magog as, their, as, as enemies together and their allies opposing Israel. That's kind of one of the mentions of Armageddon in the Old Testament, this great battle that's taking place. It's not just mentioned here in Revelation. And actually, we're going to look 
In Revelation chapter 17, we're going to flesh that battle out a little bit more than what we're seeing right here. Um, I'm probably going to end with this because I, I don't think I can finish this last one. I don't want to try to finish this last one in just a second. So um, up until now, when we've had the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments and now the bowl judgments, whenever we get to the seventh judgment, the seventh seal led to the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets, the seventh, seal, the seventh trumpet led to the seven bowls. The seventh bowl is final. Like that's it. It's like this is the first time there's not a continuation. This is the period. This is it. So just, just to recognize that, there's a finality to this last judgment that doesn't exist uh, in any other, in, in anything that we've perceived before. We've never had this finality until now. That's kind of why I don't want to rush through this last one. Because when you talk about the earthquake that shakes everything, it's, it's like nothing the world has ever seen. So all the, all the plagues and everything that's gone before has happened in microcosm before, but what's about to happen has never happened in the face of the earth, nor will ever happen again. It's almost like the flood moment again, where something happens that's never happened before. Something of that magnitude. And it doesn't have to be man-made. It doesn't have to be man-created. I would think something of that magnitude is probably supernatural. So that's, that's kind of where we're ending. So we've always done this. We've got to six, and then we go to the next seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is the finality. This is it. And so we're going to be looking at kind of refleshing out the story, finding out a little bit more information about Babylon, finding a little bit more information about the spiritual nature of Babylon, the financial nature of Babylon over the next few weeks. And then finally we'll get to Revelation chapter 20 where it is, it's over. And even in that, how God's people, how you can be in a perfect environment for, for a thousand years and you can still want the wrong thing. You can still want the wrong thing. Generations of people gone before and still want the wrong thing. It's horrible. Human nature is horrible. But, okay. Any questions? Any questions? All right, let's pray. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Thank you for um, just this view, not only of your judgment. God, this isn't just about your judgment, but over and over again, the purpose of what was happening is acknowledged so that people would have an opportunity to repent. Lord, the reason that you're doing this is you're giving those people who have not chosen a side in these last moments a chance to choose the side. They either choose to serve you and follow you or they choose to follow the beast, his image. Uh, they choose to go the wrong direction. But that's the choice that we have. And Father God, all of us today, we have that choice. We can choose today in this environment, in the world we live in today, we can choose to follow you or we can choose to reject you. That's the choice you've given each and every one of us. God, I pray that you'd help us to see the, the consequence of choosing you, which is blessing and life, and the consequence of rejecting you is death and destruction. That, that choice is the same today as it is in, in the future state of mankind. So, Lord, we want to choose today to serve Jesus and to know Jesus and to follow him. Because, Lord, not to follow you is to lose everything that we care about and everything that we love. And so, God, we choose today to serve Jesus, the one who loved us enough to die for us, to give himself for us, so that we can have life here and life everlasting. So help us to make that choice, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you guys for coming out tonight. We will pick up on 16 next week and hit 17.